My name is Ruth Gravel. I have worked as a dyslexia specialist for more than 20 years. The title of this talk is Positive Dyslexia and a New Approach to Education. I will start by referring to signs of dyslexia, which can be observed in children from about seven years of age. I will reflect upon my journey from stressful dyslexia to self-empowerment, healing and greater awareness. We will then explore the perspectives and findings of several experts in the field of positive dyslexia. Recommendations will be made. Along with this, we consider good reasons for a new education approach for all children in the UK. A statistic from the mental health charity MIND states that approximately one in four people in the UK will experience a mental health problem each year. Amongst other things, this strongly suggests that all children need to learn how to manage stress and to build resilience. They need to love and value themselves. I will recommend mindfulness and meditation practice as an integral part of the school day for every child. I suggest that the diverse and unique strengths of each child are recognised and nurtured. I recommend that children learn through play until they are seven years old, an age when most children have sufficiently developed the necessary underlying skills for learning. I propose that younger children attend a statutory kindergarten stage with much outdoor play. Excessive testing and measuring in schools must stop. With these and a few other changes in place, I predict that we can enable a creative, well-educated and far healthier and happier society within the span of just one generation. The British Dyslexia Association state that 10% of us have dyslexia. A mind map style diagram from the Times Educational Supplement provides a snapshot of the types of difficulties that dyslexic children encounter at school. Memory difficulties, especially during early years, make it very hard to learn and remember rote sequences such as the alphabet, multiplication tables, dates, numbers and names. Some children with dyslexia have less well-developed motor skills and partly because of this, they may have difficulty to form neat handwriting or if you notice that their handwriting is ultra neat, they may be compensating by putting in far too much effort, often to the detriment of content and their personal well-being. Others may attempt to disguise their spelling uncertainty within messy or minuscule handwriting all kinds of coping mechanisms can be at work to appear to comply with what appears to be expected. Reading is often a difficult skill for dyslexic children to develop too. They may frequently lose their place in text and experience print moving or overlapping. Because the mechanics of reading are such hard work, reading is rarely a pleasure for the dyslexic child. They need to reread for comprehension and sometimes still don't remember the sense of what they have read. Spelling difficulty is also apparent, with a weak visual memory for spelling and uncertainty of sound symbol recognition. Children with dyslexia often find it hard to listen and process information, especially with background noise. And there are usually writing problems too, with uncertainty of how to express ideas on the page in the expected way, and even knowing what the expected way might be. It can be quite a guessing game with so much uncertainty. Writing is also a hugely multitasking process. Spatial difficulties can cause problems with left, right and directional confusion. Children with dyslexia and other learning differences soon become aware of their educational shortcomings and how we and they respond to this can impact on their lifelong well-being and development. Each of us has a story to tell, and our stories entwine with one another. Here is part of my story in relation to experiencing dyslexia. From the age of seven, I found books too difficult to read, so I pretended to read, turning the pages over at the same rate as my peers. I used a lot of mental energy to conform to the norms of what seemed to be expected in the classroom. 
If there were no pictures in my book, I had no idea what it was about. And sometimes I gazed at the famous picture of mares and foals by Stubbs, which hung just above the sink directly in front of my desk. My written work was heavily corrected in red ink, and over the next few years, I gradually lost my confidence to write very much at all. My mother, a schoolteacher, insisted that I was assessed for dyslexia, and at the age of 10, I was seen by an educational psychologist working for the borough, who concluded that I had a low reading age. There was no report and no mention of the word dyslexia. The year was 1974, and as far as I can see, not a great deal has changed for many of our dyslexic children since then. There is excellent provision for some. Reading aloud in a class at secondary school was an extremely humiliating and stressful experience for me too. As a young teenager, it didn't occur to me that I could decline. The anticipation of it being my turn to read aloud regularly triggered the stress response. My stomach would churn, my heart would pound, my palms would sweat, and my voice would shake as I muddled up the words aloud in front of the class. This became a chronic condition for me, unconsciously releasing adrenaline, cortisol, and other stress hormones into the bloodstream in anticipation of reading is very unhealthy. And when we are in this stressful state, we do not learn, our memory does not engage, the ability to focus is very hard. This makes it clear to see how poor reading and listening comprehension can be caused or exacerbated by stress. I left school at the age of 17 with very few qualifications, feeling an absolute failure. I married at 18 and soon became a mum, returning to study once my children had started school. At that time, I had just started to sing in public too. I was developing confidence through one of my strengths. Rehearsing the songs also helped me to improve my memory, listening skills and self-belief. I thought that if I could learn the words to 15 songs and sing them in front of an audience, then surely I could pass my English GCSE. After a lot of hard work, I did. My dyslexia was officially recognised at the age of 27. When the educational psychologist said, yes, you are dyslexic, I felt so very relieved. This was confirmation that I wasn't stupid, something that I absolutely needed to hear. As an undergraduate, I relied heavily on my parents for support because my study skills were not yet well developed and I still felt terribly inadequate and ashamed. At my request, my father went through my essays with a fine tooth comb and my mother recorded the weekly reading materials for me to listen to through headphones as I followed the text. This eased the mechanics of reading for me, allowing me the space to comprehend. To the outside world, I presented as able and studious, but the little girl who couldn't read was still there then, albeit trying to set herself free. My dissertation was entitled The Psychosocial Effects of Unrecognised Dyslexia, and I have been studying this topic ever since, trying to get to the bottom of it all, because it doesn't all add up, especially when we are entangled in the way that this learning difference has been perceived by society as a learning difficulty, a disorder to correct, or a disability, when it is not. One of the first books which helped me to identify with the downside of dyslexia, and therefore also the need for me to reframe, is called The Scars of Dyslexia by Janice Edwards, published in 1994. The research of Edwards aimed to find some common factors which would account for the achievements of eight successful dyslexic young men. Instead, she found they had emotional battle scars from their appalling educational experiences. If further evidence is required to confirm that undiagnosed and unsupported or inappropriately supported dyslexia is damaging to a person's well-being, this book will enlighten you. A flashing red beacon for change. Thomas West's book, The Mind's Eye, was published in 1991 and 2009. This book is a classic in the field of dyslexia and provides a compelling argument for the great importance of visual thinking 
and visual technologies, as well as recognising the highly creative potential of many individuals with dyslexia and other learning differences. West, who is dyslexic himself and didn't learn to read until he had been at primary school for three years, describes people with dyslexia as late bloomers. He says that dyslexics are still building their brain power when everyone else has stopped. West's 2017 book, Seeing What Others Cannot See, The Hidden Advantages of Visual Thinkers and Differently Wired Brains, includes referral to extremely creative, intelligent people with dyslexia and other learning differences and shows how they think differently. West demonstrates that people with such diverse thinking can provide important insights overlooked by experts, as they can also prevent institutional group think. Maria Chilver's book, Dyslexia and Alternative Therapies, was published in 2006. This was of tremendous interest to me when I started to get involved with dyslexia and healing work. The book describes a huge number of therapies to help enable well-being for people suffering from the emotional effects of experiencing dyslexia. And in doing so, it acknowledges the need for people to recognise and reduce the related stresses and stress in their lives, to find inner peace, to balance their mind-body, to recognise their strengths and to train their brain. In The Dyslexic Advantage, published in 2011, neuro-learning experts, doctors ID and ID, firstly acknowledge the encounters of failure and personal suffering that the experience of dyslexia and other learning differences can bring, especially during childhood and then use the analogy that we have been looking down the wrong end of the telescope at the concept of dyslexia, merely seeing the challenges that it presents. They say that traditional views of dyslexia as a disorder or a disease are unhelpful. They propose that the brains of individuals aren't defective, they are simply different, and that these wiring differences can often lead to special strengths. The nervous system of dyslexic people has been organised to work in different ways and we must look very hard for the talents and strengths that people have. Where there is a weakness, we can often identify a strength right alongside it. They say we must look through the correct end of the telescope to encompass the broader view where the strengths are clearly visible. Positive Dyslexia by Professor Roderick Nicholson was published in 2015. In this book, Nicholson parallels the terms positive psychology and positive dyslexia, again directing on our strengths, which are within each one of us. Nicholson proposes that society needs to change to recognise the strengths in the dyslexic person rather than focus on correcting their weaknesses. The book cover depicts three remaining columns and a horizontal support of an ancient temple. And Nicholson describes each of the columns to symbolise three strengths that his research has identified within the dyslexia profile. Three social strengths, teamwork, empathy and communication. Three cognitive strengths, big picture, visualisation and creativity and innovation. Three work strengths, determination, resilience, proactivity and flexible coping. And he describes these strengths to all be capped and integrated by a strength in unconventional thinking. In his book, he demonstrates not only that these strengths are characteristic of dyslexia, but also that they are precisely the skills needed for individuals and organisations to flourish in the 21st century. If you go to Rod Nicholson's website, you can download what he calls the show book for free. It's interactive and dyslexia friendly. www.positivedyslexia.org Nicholson also proposes that dyslexic children learn differently, not worse, differently. Their brains are less plastic, needing longer to build the necessary circuitry and habits. He says, dyslexic individuals are relatively slow to automise skills, 
so there is a delayed neurological commitment. And with this, there is a warning against the teaching of reading too soon. He says, dyslexic children of five years are not reading ready. He also says that the creativity of all children, not just the dyslexic ones, can be quashed through learning too soon. Nicholson says that on the plus side for the dyslexic, the delayed neurological commitment can lead to a range of benefits, including greater flexibility later in life. Nicholson uses the phrase, failing to learn, learning to fail, with repeated experience of failures in class leading to mental abscesses and learnt helplessness in the school situation. Comparative, he says, with post-traumatic stress disorder, with the stress response, the autonomic nervous system of fight, flight and freeze setting into place. Nicholson states that a learning disability may therefore be caused by toxic school experiences. Not only can I identify with this description personally, but much of my work in 2019 is still about helping people to heal themselves from toxic school experiences, to believe in themselves and to learn and work in ways that suit them best. If you identify with these kinds of toxic experiences and have not yet let them go, please know that this is possible to do and it starts with a positive intention. In another talk, I will describe some holistic healing approaches to help people recognise and shift the stress and stressors often associated with dyslexic experience. But of course, prevention is far better than cure. Nicholson recommends that if these catastrophic problems are to be avoided, this may be best achieved preschool by using individual playful apps to provide the necessary foundations and by delaying formal instruction. The necessary foundations referred to include the development of the executive function skills, which are described as the brain's air traffic control system in working paper 11 by Harvard University. At the age of seven, many children have sufficiently developed working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility to learn and function effectively in everyday life. But children with dyslexia and other learning differences are often found to have some weaker underlying skills than their peers, including their capacity to remember information they have heard, to process sounds in language, to visualise words for spelling and to develop reading skills. Children who have experienced adversity at an early age also tend to have less well-developed foundation skills. Nicholson recommends brain training apps to help children to develop the skills including attention, visual and auditory memory. If these are used, it is important to identify apps that the individual child enjoys we certainly don't want them to struggle and feel frustrated with them. Professor Nicholson's research and the research of many others also provides evidence that a delay in formal instruction would enable all children, not just the dyslexic ones. All children under seven years of age learn best through play. Children under seven learn best through play. I wonder why then, that the UK education system still has a compulsory school starting age of five years. The UK, along with six other European countries, has the compulsory starting age of five, although in practice, many children start any time after their fourth birthday, depending upon the time of year their birthday falls. Meanwhile, the school starting age has been six in most European countries for many years, and seven in a few others, including Finland, Poland and Estonia, which are recognised to be three of the more academically successful countries. I applaud and promote the work of an organisation called Upstart in Scotland, who are tirelessly campaigning for all children in Scotland to delay formal education until the age of seven years. They propose play, not tests, for the under-sevens, with outdoor play in touch with nature being of great importance, enabling children to build the necessary foundations 
before starting formal education. Upstart remind us that childhood isn't a race. You can visit www.upstart.scot to find out more about their research and work or watch their excellent short video entitled Play, Not Tests for the Under 7s. Denmark has been voted as the world's happiest nation and many preschoolers in Denmark attend forest kindergartens where they learn outside in nature until they are seven years old. Amongst other things, they skid through mud, sharpen sticks with knives and climb trees. They learn in the natural world whilst developing their foundation skills, including balance and coordination, trust and awareness of danger, for example. These children are far better prepared for a more formal education by the age of seven years when they start school. Over recent years, on occasion, parents have reported to me that their child's teacher has said, there's not much point in having your child assessed for dyslexia because they won't get any more help than they're already getting. If you are a teacher with this view, please do explain further. After much thought, I sense that the roots of this statement entwine with the rigidity of the school programme, which currently makes it almost impossible for learners with dyslexia and other learners to truly flourish. Some class teachers may feel that they are being asked to provide the impossible. Where dyslexia is suspected, I recommend that an assessment is carried out as soon as possible and from the age of seven years. Professor Nicholson uses the term positive dyslexia assessment to encourage all assessors to further highlight the key strengths of individuals and to further integrate positive dyslexia theory within their report framework. Some time ago, I assessed a teenage student who was exceptionally talented at art, but who experienced difficulties with reading, writing, spelling, memory, and processing information, and she found learning to be challenging and stressful. I scanned some of her artwork into the page of a report under the heading of strengths. More recently, I was informed that it was due to my positive dyslexia report that she studied art A-level and went on to study graphic design at university. This certainly was a worthwhile report, which I am proud to have written. Following assessment, a carefully developed individual learning plan needs to be prepared, implemented and regularly reviewed. In 2011, ID and ID made the point that we need to help children and adults to become better at being dyslexic. They say that identifying and enabling learners' strengths is key. And the new approach to education needs to be sufficiently flexible to accommodate this. We need to help learners to develop study skills in ways which work for them. If, for example, they have good verbal skills, but clearly struggle to spell and express themselves easily through written work, we can enable them to use alternative methods, such as voice recognition technology, typing, and or have access to a scribe, early on. We need to enable children to work at their ability level. Some years ago, I worked with a child who experienced significant dyslexic and dysgraphic difficulties. After much testing and negotiation, I managed to secure him a reader and a scribe for the exams. I was then assigned to be that reader and scribe. After writing a lengthy sentence he had dictated to me, I looked at, up at him for the next. He was beaming directly at me with a pencil secured in each nostril and in each ear. I connected to his gaze for long enough to acknowledge the significance of this communication. Schools have a duty under the Equality Act 2010 to make reasonable adjustments to avoid putting disabled pupils at a substantial disadvantage compared to non-disabled pupils. For learners with dyslexia, which counts as a disability, reasonable adjustments in exams, such as extra time or the use of a scribe and reader, can help to ensure that they are not at a substantial disadvantage. Surely they should not be disadvantaged at all. Unfortunately, in 2019, we still have a rigid set of criteria 
to measure students' suitability to qualify for these adjustments, even for extra time to process information and to proofread. From my observations, many students are still being unfairly disadvantaged in exams. If you want to find out more about the current criteria for exam access arrangements, please visit the Joint Council of Qualifications at www.jcq.org.uk. Other ways that teachers can help to enable children within the traditional education system include listening and talking with them about any learning issues, allowing them extra time to copy information, providing them with handouts of key lesson notes, breaking things down into small manageable chunks, supporting them with homework, organisation, memory, and never assuming that a child is happy to read aloud in the class, significantly reducing weekly spellings, reducing the working memory load, and assisting children to find strategies that work for them. And I would like to reinforce the priority of identifying and removing dyslexia-related stressors. But stress is certainly not exclusive to the dyslexic population. The statistic reported by the charity Mind states that one in four people in the UK experience a mental health problem every year. To create a healthier and happier society, like Upstart in Scotland, a statutory play-based kindergarten stage from three to seven years is proposed for the UK with plenty of outdoor play. It is recommended that every child practices meditation and mindfulness exercises every day from the age of three and throughout their education years. This new approach to education also requires the removal of excessive testing and measuring. We need to stop forcing children to achieve goals within the so-called normal range and embrace their individual diversity of relative strengths and weaknesses. Children also need to learn how they learn best early on through study skills classes. In addition to the traditional academic subjects, more arts, technology, sports and employment related skills are recommended. I envisage the new schooling system to include the practice of organic gardening, following through to the food preparation and any related cooking. They will learn how to keep a healthy body and mind to minimise toxins in their system. I propose that these, along with other recommendations I have suggested, will significantly improve the mental health and physical well-being of society within just one generation. Let us recognise and nurture the strengths of all children, so enabling them to flourish. Above all, enable our children, who are tomorrow's parents after all, to grow up in a loving and nurturing environment, not only in their homes, but also throughout their education. Their brains are fine, designed to shine, align in different ways. And this is why we must Yes.